Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 172 of the Book Cougars, two middle-aged women on the hunt for a good read. I'm Emily. And I'm Cress. Happy New Year. Yeah, Happy New Year. Happy 2023, everyone. You may have noticed some new music at the beginning. Yeah, thank you to Pat, our sound guy who, you know, happens to be Tony Award winning and stuff like that. (laughs) We really appreciate him putting together some new music for us. Yeah, we thought, you know, it's our seventh season. So I don't know, were we getting a seven year edge maybe? Um, (laughs) (laughs) So we have some new music and thank you to Pat for putting that together. We both love the cello so much. We both played the cello when we were younger and wanted something to reflect that love. Yeah. And our original music we found sitting together and we love that for these past six years, but we're excited to try something new. Well, we're excited to announce our theme for our 2023 read alongs. If you're new to the podcast, every quarter we do a read along The last several years, we've had a theme to help guide us in our choice of books. Originally, we were just choosing books that both of us wanted to read and never got around to, like The English Patient, I think, was one of our early choices. Yeah, I think that was our first first read-along. Okay, yeah. Yeah, it was. Oh, wow. Okay, so (laughs) yeah, so the last couple years, we've had themes, and our theme this year is... Books about books. Which is a huge category. (laughs) Yes, we are excited about it because we could go in all sorts of directions, nonfiction, fiction, memoir. Um, We're not sure of all four quarter picks, but for now, we are very excited about the first quarter. Yes, our first quarter read along pick is going back in time. It's considered one of the first Biblio mysteries. And it is called... Parnassus on Wheels by Christopher Morley. It's readily available. We've looked in library systems. We've looked for audio versions. There's audio versions available on Libro.fm and Audible. We found at least three different recordings too, which is kind of fun. And then it's also available on Project Gutenberg. Yes. For free. Yeah. So this book came out in 1917. So it is going back in time a bit. But we thought it would be great to kick off our year of books about books with one of the first Biblio Mysteries. Yeah, super excited about it. There's two books. The second book is called The Haunted Bookshop. We decided we didn't want to get overzealous and <laughs> and do both. We might try to read both. And there is even a copy of the book, which I'll link to in the show notes, that has both, both yeah, stories in one book. because Parnassus on Wheels is really short. I think one of the editions we looked at was 98 pages. Mm-hmm. So it's short. The Haunted Bookshop is a little bit longer. We just know that when we have the Zoom conversation, it can be really challenging to try and talk about two books in any type of depth yeah. in an hour. Yeah. So we're going to go with that first one. Feel free to read both and report back. Like I said, we might try to do that as well. The Zoom discussion with our listeners will take place on Sunday, February 26th at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Send us an email at bookcougars at gmail.com if you want to join us. And we'll be talking about the book together on episode 176. Seems far away, but we know it's around the corner. Yeah, it is right there. (laughs) Yeah. And yeah, so if you've been with us before for a Zoom call, we hope you join us again. And if you haven't done it, you know, please sign up. We're a pretty friendly bunch, I think. We are indeed. So being that it's the first episode of a new year, we thought we would just do a little bit of housekeeping. We know some of you have been listeners since the very beginning. Thank you. We also know we're picking up new listeners as we go. So we just wanted to touch base with people about how to find us. We're on social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, at Book Cougars. Right. And we're on Goodreads. We have a Goodreads discussion group there. Everyone is welcome to join. We have a post for each episode as well as uh, discussions threads for each read along that we do. So that's a place to talk about books we've read. And some of those read alongs of the past or episodes of the past, feel free to comment on those or join the conversation because we do get notifications with new comments. So we will be able to see that there's activity and we will jump in and talk with you. Very excitedly. Totally. (laughs) I always get so excited when there's someone (laughs) on our Goodreads thread. Yes. (laughs) And then we also wanted to remind people about how you can support the podcast. 
Yeah, I mean, the, the coolest thing you could do is just tell people about us, spread the word. If you enjoy our content, let your friends know, share us on social media, or you can also become a Patreon supporter. If you're interested in ABLE, you can have a monthly donation from a dollar on up. As we've said before, it's really easy to stop that, increase it, decrease it, whatever you'd like to do. It's a super simple platform, and even a dollar a month can really help us out a lot. Indeed. And then we also are affiliates of bookshop.org and libro.fm. Really appreciate those of you who've been shopping via our affiliates. That helps a lot, too. Yeah, it sure does. There is a lot of folks shopping for the holidays on bookshop.org. Yeah, we really appreciate it. And also, you can just send us an individual donation. We have a big thank you. Yeah, thank you to Susan from New Jersey who sent us a check. That's always an option too. I know people prefer to sometimes do it that way to not have credit cards online. Yeah, and then we also have PayPal, bookcougars at gmail.com. <laughs> There's so many ways, people. Yeah. The so, other thing you can do is just email us if you have any questions, and we really can just let you know. Right, yeah. So thank you so much, Susan. And then the last thing we want to remind you about is our monthly newsletter. That, too, you can find at bookcougars.com. We send out one newsletter a month with some interesting information. At least we think it's interesting. <laughs> yeah, usually just little updates about what we've been doing or what's coming up or reminders about the current read along. And that's completely free. And we obviously don't, well, obviously, that's not obvious. We don't sell your address or anything like that. And we don't charge for the newsletter. It's completely free. And just thank you all for being here with us. We have so much fun doing this podcast and talking about books. And part of what makes it fun is that we know there are so many people out there that love to read as much as we do. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> and we get so many great recommendations from listeners. We love that, too. I mean, I think that's probably the most fun part about being on social media is the recommendations. I agree. That people give us. Yeah. And seeing where people are taking Biblio adventures as well, right. you know, which just makes us incredibly jealous, but <laughs> also helps us plan for the future. For sure. So speaking of recommendations, the other thing we're really excited about is getting your top reads of 2022. Yeah, we started doing this a couple of years ago, asking listeners for what your top 10 reads have been, whether it's fiction, nonfiction, whatever. We just ask you to submit the author in the title. And then Emily combines it all into a spreadsheet, which is a lot of fun. And the books don't have to have been published in 2022. I know one of the books on my top 10 is, you know, from what, 1919, I think, maybe. So if you listen to it, you read it, it doesn't matter. We would love to hear what your top 10 are. It's so much fun to see like what the popular books have been for this year, and then what classics people are reading. And there's always titles that we've never heard of, which are fun to learn about. Yeah, it's fun. And it's also like, oh, my gosh, there are so many books. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> But this year, we're doing something different. We used to ask you to just send us an email, but we actually put together a little Google form, super easy to fill out. The link to it is bit.ly, that's bit.ly slash book cougars top 10 2022. Look for the link in our show notes for that. Yeah. And if you don't want to deal with that, send us an email, but really <laughs> try and use the Google form because that automatically populates all that info so Emily doesn't have to do the spreadsheet thing. Yeah, I like to do data entry, but it's pretty exciting to know that the computer can do some of it for us. For sure. All right. All right. Everybody coming up next, we have our special guest, Russell of Ink and Paper Blog. He's a big time booktuber. We're happy to call him a friend. And he's coming back for the third year in a row now to share his top 10 reads with us. So enjoy. All right. So we are so thrilled to have again with us Russell from Ink and Paper Blog. This is our third annual time meeting together to talk about our top 10 reads of the year-ish. <laughs> There's usually a little sneaky sneaky that goes on. So we'll see what happens tonight. Thanks so much for being with us today, Russell. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to see what books are brought up this year. 
Same here. Yeah, Chris is, yeah. Chris is our, she arrived with a stack and started throwing books on the floor. Like she's rethinking things, shuffling cards. So we're going to see how this goes. <laughs> yeah, I've had a harder time this year whittling it down to 10. Yeah, I have too, but maybe that's because I've already, I figured out how to sneak things in already. Yes. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I, I'm going to say about mine, I don't know how you guys have arranged this. Mine are not in any particular order. I'm just going to talk about books that are all in my top 10 because putting them in order adds a layer of stress that I can't handle. (laughs) Well, um, for those of you who have listened to me before, I do have mine in order from 10 to one. So that is how my brain works. And I had a very clear top three. Mm. So they can shuffle, I think on any given day, but um, the rest of them, I feel good with where they landed. So Mm. Excellent. All right. Well, mine are not in any order either. So, okay. But Russell, whenever you're ready, take us away. Okay. So I'm going to say, um, for those of your listeners that don't know me, one, I tend to read a lot of books that people don't hear a lot about. So we'll start there. And I had a very specific theme to my reading this year. The books are either queer or they cause me to have tears. (laughs) <laughs> so that is very much the theme of Russell's reading in 2022. So um, the first book I wanted to talk about, number 10 on my list, is called Parish by Dr. I don't know why it's not in there, Dr. Latoya Watkins. This is from Tiny Reparation or Tiny Rep Books. And this is a book no one talked about, and I feel like that is just an absolute misjustice. So this is the story of a family. It starts with a woman who is pregnant, and she is pregnant again. She's very young, and we find out that it's not for good reasons. And she's trying to get rid of the baby. She doesn't want it. But she makes sort of this vow with God that if she keeps the baby She will raise the baby if everything goes well. She just wants it to go well, and she doesn't want what has happened to her to happen again. And what happens is we see how that affects her entire family. And it becomes this meditation on the idea of trauma and abuse and how it doesn't only affect one member of the family and how it can sort of have this trickle-down effect to her daughters, to her grandchildren, and how stuff like this sort of permeates through an entire family and it's one of those ones it's this is in the tears category it's just like so hard because you know that you know all of this stuff is working against this family and they're trying really hard to overcome it and it's just obstacle after obstacle at the beginning of the book she's ill so everyone's coming back to say goodbye and having to sort of rectify themselves with the decisions and actions that they've made and where they're at It is some of the best writing, some of the most powerful discussions regarding generational trauma, and also just like this idea of how hard it is to get to the other side sometimes. I thought it was beautiful. I think it's a tough book. I'm not going to lie. It does tackle a lot of really tough topics, but it was something I'd never read before and sort of the way it presented itself. And I just thought it was brilliant. And it's a debut novel. And um, she's a little bit older to have a debut, but yeah, she's fantastic. She's out of Texas and I loved it in that whole sort of cry, cry, cry sort of way. (laughs) I've never heard of it. Thank you so much. I'm going to definitely look that one up. It's a tough read, Emily. It will cause the heart to scrunch a little. Yeah, I seem to be having a a theme of books that are about collateral damage, you know, from the people left behind. And that sounds like it fits right in there. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You want to go next, Chris? No, you you can go. Okay, Okay. you can go. (laughs) Well, this one surprised me when I was looking through all the books I read that it ended up on my top reads, but it's one I've thought back to quite often. It's called Hidden Pictures by Jason Reculak. It's in the horror genre, which is not something I frequently read. And it was one of those things where I had gotten an arc. I've read his other book, which was kind of a feel good, fun, very funny book. And so I just opened the pages and started reading into my horror. <laughs> it was not funny. It was a ghost story, but it drew me right in. And it's about Mallory, who's a 21-year-old recovering addict 
She's living in a safe home and her sponsor comes up to her and says, I've gotten you this great job as a nanny in the suburbs of Philadelphia. The family interviews her. She meets their five-year-old son. They agree that she'll come live with them in this cottage in the backyard. And she moves in and suddenly the son, Teddy, starts drawing very creepy pictures and telling her very scary stories. And nobody really believes her because here she is, this recovered addict. So they think, oh, you're just using again, you know. It comes to quite an interesting turn of events that I do not want to spoil at all. But I really enjoyed it. And it's it has these really interesting illustrations because the the young boy is telling the story partly through these drawings. And I wanted to just shout out the illustrators. Names are Will Stahl and Dougie, Doogie Horner. And it won the Goodreads People's Choice Award for Horror. I was happy to see that for Jason. And I think Russell, I know, Chris, you were there at the Booktopia where he spoke and he had that book called Penis Pokey. That he oh, yes. I remember, Jason. Yes. 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 Yeah. yes. Yeah. Which thank you to Linda Johnson because I didn't remember the name of that book and she did. So um, anyway, it's called Hidden Pictures, Jason Reculak. Surprise to my yes. top 10. Yeah. And well, and the Penis Pokey was funny because the event was taking place in the children's section, which <laughs> made him quite happy. <laughs> and it was a board book, but for adults. Well, I believe at the time, wasn't he the one of the editors of Quirk Brooks? Mm-hmm. And he was talking about how that was their best selling book. Yes. Of all the titles that they had put out, it was <laughs> yes. this book. Yeah. I think he's a full time author now. Yeah, I think I, think, I believe so. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of cool. Totally cool. Yeah. I really love that other book of his. I can't think of the title of it. I Fort, know. Was it Fort, something with Fortress? In Invisible the Fortress. Yeah. yeah. So funny. So well done. Yeah, like in the 80s. If you grew up in the 80s, you would love that book. Well, my book, my first one I'll talk about is All That She Carried, The Journey of Ashley Sack, A Black Family Keepsake by Taya Miles. This one just blew me away. It was one that I wanted to read. It was one that Emily and I talked about doing last year when our theme was nonfiction, but you know, there's only four books. So uh, yeah, so I was really happy to read this. It is a remarkable book. It talks about American systematic slavery of the 19th century in a way that I've that's completely new. And what the story is, and I've talked about this a lot on the podcast, so I won't go into great detail. But there's this artifact that was a sack onto which an ancestor of Ashley embroidered the story of the sack and how a young girl was sold away from her mother and her mother put these things in the sack for her, for her survival. And so Miles, what she does is she looks at the love and the connection between these women and what enslaved women tried to do to carry on their connections between one another and their love So it's a book about American slavery that focuses on love, which is so different. And she brings in so many different, different fields of study. You know, there's a chapter about pecan trees and pecans and about environmental issues. And then, of course, a lot of history. But it's really written for a popular audience. It's not a highly academic book although it could go there if you wanted it to. It's one of those nonfiction books. I mean, it does have tons of notes and everything if you want to investigate, but her notes at the end really explain her methodology and her framework in a way that you can really understand that she's trying to create something new out of the historical record, seeing the historical record in a different way. So it's a brilliant book. It's not an easy read, because it is dealing with a horrific topic. But she brings these people to life in such a way that you can envision maybe a better future. And that's one of the things she tries to tie in, is looking at the past to tell stories of resilience and love to help us today. So that's all that she carried, The Journey of Ashley Sack, a Black Family Keepsake by Taya Miles. 
and it did win the National Book Award a couple of years ago. I was just ago. about to say that. I really thought it did. It won the National Book Award a couple of years ago. Yeah, it's really mm. amazing. I could totally see rereading it again sometime. Yeah, that one's on my list, too. Oh, my God, my TBR. Exploding. <laughs> Well, so to go in a completely different direction for me, for my number nine book, I did a project this year where I tried to read more gay YA novels, just because they always tend to be rather happy and cheerful, and they always have a happy ending. And 2022 was just one of those years that in the real world and in work, it was just a lot. So I was really looking for some books to give me bright spots. So my number nine book is called A Little Bit Country by Brian D. Kennedy. And this is the story of Emmett and Luke. Now, Emmett is, I think they're both like 16 years old. Emmett wants to be the first gay superstar country singer. That's like his goal. So he gets a job at his favorite singer's amusement park. Her name is Wanda Jean. She is very much based on our icon Dolly Parton, very, very much so. And he's so excited. He's young. His parents don't really want him to go there, but his aunt lives in the area. So he convinces them and he goes there and he meets this boy named Luke, who actually has a very big aversion to country music because of something in the past that happened with Wanda Jean. They meet each other and it's like all that cute romance stuff. And you remember when you were 16 and you got giddy when like your hands touched walking and all that totally adorable stuff. And then you find out that there's much more to the story of Luke's family and Wanda Jean. And there's other history that um, he wasn't aware of that makes him more comfortable in his skin. He's not out of the closet. And once he starts to learn some stuff, he starts to become more himself and their relationship sort of takes off. It is charming and lovely and sweet and everything you need if you just want just a little happy moment. I mean, it has its ups and downs, but, and in the same time, it's like, you can tell it's a Dolly Parton and you can tell you're at Dollywood and <laughs> you're just totally loving all of that too. So Absolutely loved it. It was adorable. A Little Bit Country by Brian D. Kennedy, who is obsessed with Dolly Parton, if you follow him on Twitter or Instagram. So I love him so much. And um, his book was really, I could have, yeah, I may do a whole video on them, but that book just really cheered me up. Oh, so cool. I have a copy of that book. I'm, I intended to read it this summer, but my summer got a little hijacked. Um, so I do look forward to reading that one. So glad it's you enjoyed cool. it. Well, I'm going to let the cheating begin. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you're doing it first. <laughs> so my next is a series of books by Maggie Smith. Um, last year when we all met, her her book of essays, Keep Moving, Notes on Loss, Creativity, and Change, was one of my top ten books. And that was an um, essay collection that she put together as she was going through her divorce. She started kind of a Twitter, Instagram campaign where Every day she would just wake up and say to herself, keep moving and write something that would inspire herself and ended up inspiring others. And it became this book of essays and very thoughtful things. And last year for the holidays, I got keep moving the journal, thrive through change and create a life you love. And I've spent this year really working through it. I mean, I thought I would, my goal was to get through it over the course of the year. And I haven't, I'm about halfway. And that's because it really is very thought provoking. And there are some times when I turn a page and, you know, she has sections from the keep moving book, but then she'll say, you know, who are people in your life that you may have some work to do around? And I'm like, I think I'm going to put this away for a month <laughs> and come back to it. But I am time and time again, coming back to it and really enjoying it. And then Coming out in April is her memoir, You Could Make This Place Beautiful, which I loved. Talked about it recently on the podcast. Not out yet, but you can pre-order it now, which would be very helpful to her. And what I love about her memoir and these other two keep moving the book and the journal is she really has a way of creating a new way to look at things and to even write a memoir She's not afraid to take chances as a poet, which I really appreciate. And um, when I talked about the memoir on the an earlier episode of the podcast, I read the epigraph, which she has, is I am out with lanterns looking for myself by Emily Dickinson. And I feel like all of her work has allowed me to be out with a lantern 
creeping under rocks <laughs> looking for myself. And I really appreciate her and her work. And she's great to follow on Twitter and Instagram if you're so interested and inclined. Nice. Well, my next book is going to be kind of, well, it's the last book I read, actually. And I didn't anticipate this being in my top 10, but I just have to say that it's Louise Penny's new novel, A World of Curiosities. I mean, I'm blown away by this book. Like, it's number 18 in her Three Pines, Chief Inspector Gamache series. And I knew I would enjoy it because I enjoy all of her novels. But it is so well done. I mean, the thing about Louise Penny is she can write about really horrific, hard realities of life and things that happen to people. The main character is an investigator in homicide, so you know there's awful things happening. But it's so, I don't even want to use the word balanced. It's just a world where horrific things happen, but there's also hope and also love. I'm amazed that she can write these stories that are uh, I I don't even know what word to use to describe them really Hmm. they just make me feel happy to be alive and they give me hope for humanity people talk about how authors who write these series you know 18 books into this series this is when series usually start dying right they start going downhill they start jumping the shark (laughs) (laughs) you know for those of you who are of a certain age you remember that from Happy days when they have Fonzie take his motorcycle and jump over a shark tank because that's how bad the show was getting. They had to do something extreme to get people to watch. That's not the case with Louise Penny at all. And I think like for readers who haven't read her yet, this is a great novel to just go ahead and jump in and start with this one. You might not feel the depth of it because you won't be as familiar with the characters. Obviously, you don't have those years of backstory with them, but she explores so many things, a lot of misogyny in the world, going back to the days when witches were burned to contemporary times. There's the criminal investigation. There is archival discoveries, lots of good fun, but also serious things as well. And it is, you know, content warning for child abuse, sexual abuse and things like that. But I always leave a Louise Penny novel feeling hope. That's amazing, considering that subject matter. And is it in present day? Like, is it pandemic-y at all or no? No, it's not pandemic-y. That's a new word I just made up, yeah. apparently. But Her last one was, you know, it had some dealings with that. But this one, I mean, she mentions it as something that was in the past, okay. kind of. Yeah, because there's a drawing by one of Armand's grandchildren, that the kid did during the pandemic. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. Just that. yeah. Really amazing. A World of Curiosities by Louise Penny. It's been getting huge raves, lots of starred reviews, and I am on board with it. Yeah. I just got her copy today. I'm excited because I've, I read the first one and then I was like, I can't do it. I can't read all these books. And Chris assured me I can hop in with this one. So, yeah, you can. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, Russell, have you read any of them? I have not. Okay. No. Because like for me, you know, I've said this before, too, but a a couple friends told me you have to read it. You have to read this series. And I think at that time she was about seven books in. And I finally read the first one and it took me like three or four tries to get into the first one. And I was just like, I don't see what people see in this at all. But I read it and then I thought, well, I'll try the next one. And then I read the next one. And then after the fourth book is when it really took off for me and as I've said, like I went through the series after that, like a wood chipper, like however I could get the book from the library on my Kobo at the time, I audio, I, I got it however I could. Well, I'm just going to jump in at 18. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So start at the beginning or start at 18, but just start. You'll enjoy it. I hope. Yeah. I'm not a series person, but maybe if this is one that you can read as a one off, maybe I'll. I'll pick that up. So I don't think you miss things. I mean, it'd be interesting for you two to read it. And see what you think. Mm -hmm. Um, Because for me, I'm amazed at how she can weave stuff in from past books. It's just like, how the hell did she do that? You know, like, I remember that. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I'm sure there are a lot of things I don't remember. Okay, you guys, I can't wait to hear what you think. (laughs) Okay, my turn again, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so my book is Our Missing Hearts by Celeste Ng. So this is Celeste Ng's third book. I have read everything that she has written. I love everything that she has written. All three of her books are fantastic. 
this is a disclaimer. I have a hard time describing this book. I don't know why, but I think it's because there's this overarching social commentary and then there's the story set within it. So it's set in a sort of offset of what would be our modern times. America has had a bunch of issues and it's passed this law called PACT, which is Protect America's Culture something. I can't remember exactly. But basically what America has done, it has blamed everything that has gone wrong on China. It's just totally blamed everything on China. So Asian Americans are being treated and pulled out of their homes and just being ostracized in America. Our main character is a young boy named Bertie. His dad is white and his mom is um, Asian. And um, she has gone missing. She disappeared. And he is being raised without her. And he has to pretend he doesn't know who she is. Because if he does... He could possibly be taken away from his father. Children are being taken out of families that teach un-American ideas. And one day he gets this little letter in the mail and it's a drawing and he becomes certain that it's a message from his mother. And so he decides to go and find her. And that's all I'll really say about that plot point. But what the book does is horrifyingly takes you into a world that could be tomorrow. It's just so real in the fact that in America, we have so many rules that just sort of focus on all these different marginalized communities and they come into force and there are laws that exist and it wouldn't be that hard to see this happen. And you just watch not only how this family has been torn apart, but how the world has reacted to it. And there's this rebel unit that is using this poem written by Bertie's mother as sort of their mantra. Where are the children going? Where are our missing hearts? And this falls into my tears category because it just, it's one of those books that's fiction, but is so real. And you just see things on the news and you go, we are one step from doing that to so many different groups. If the wrong people are in control. I thought it was brilliant. I thought it was heartrending. I thought it, the characters are fantastic. I can't say enough about Celestine. If you haven't read any of her books, all of them, they're all so different. Yeah. This book broke my heart in so many ways and uh, put it all back together and then broke it again. <laughs> yeah, I've read her other two and I haven't gotten to this one. And are, people are kind of calling it dystopian. Is that just because it's not taking place today? Yeah, I guess it's, I would say it's like an alternate U.S. It's not dystopian in that the world has been destroyed or anything like that, but it is in like a militarized America that has happened because of this reaction. When I think dystopian, I think like the world is destroyed or, you know, we're out of water or stuff like that. That's not this. It's sort of just like what happens if these people made this decision and just shifted the blame. So it's kind of like a handmaid's tale in that way. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Very fair in comparison. Okay. Yeah, a lot of ways. Yeah. Yeah, that one's on my list. Got it. Oh, geez. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is one of the joys of doing this, you know, because you do get to kind of live vicariously as a reader through other readers. Even yes. if you can't get, at, well, you can't get to every book. Yeah, I don't know. I, okay, I'm going to think that way. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> I think I took two books, one from each of your lists last year. I can't remember. Um, I read a graphic novel from Chris. Can't remember the one I pulled from you, Emily. I'm sorry, off of the top of my head. But I loved both of them. So if I walk away with one book from each of you, I feel like a winner. Yeah, that's a good goal. Thanks, Russell. That makes me feel better. <laughs> well, this might be the one you want because I loved this book so much. The Mad Woman's Ball by Victoria Moss. I picked this up literally because of the cover. Chris and I had a day where we hit three bookstores owned by the same people and the Toadstool bookstores, mm -hmm. bookshops. Toadstool, yep, up yeah. in New Hampshire. Yeah. And by the third store, when I saw it again and it was catching my eye, I was like, okay, I'm buying this thing. So eye-catching cover, Victoria Moss is the author and it was translated from the French by Frank Wynne. And if you're a nonfiction reader, this book is fiction, but there are parts of it that almost make it feel like nonfiction because it's based on a real place. And they even have like footnotes in it, which was really interesting. I've never read a novel quite like that. So it takes place in 1885 at the Salpetriere Asylum. That's Emily speaking French right there. <laughs> 
in Paris where Dr. Charcot is a uh, hypnotizing women that are quote mad. And some of them are mad because, you know, they're women that have bodies that maybe they are going through menopause or they've, you know, similar ideas to what when women were called hysterical. So he hypnotizes them to try to take the mad out of them and does this in a theater where people come to watch. And the main character here is Genevieve, who's one of the nurses who totally believes in everything. She has fallen for this doctor and everything he's doing and kind of is very harsh with the women until Eugenie arrives and is someone who can communicate with spirits and starts to communicate with Genevieve's sister who died. And so that kind of forces Genevieve to believe. And this young woman, Eugenie, was brought and dropped off by her family and left. And she's incredibly intelligent and does not belong in an asylum as most of the women didn't, you know. I loved it. It was interesting. The title comes from once a year, there's a ball where all of these women dress up and they really look forward to it. And people come and kind of gawk at them. So very unusual. Really enjoyed it. The Mad Woman's Ball by Victoria Moss. And I thought about you, Russell, and Jana, especially when I was reading it. That, it sounds fantastic. Why did you think of them? I know their reading tastes and I just think they would enjoy it. I can't explain it. I guess just years of reading together. Okay. <laughs> I have seen this book and yes, this cover is beautiful. Yes. Okay. It's on my list. Awesome. Oh, what to pick next? Um, I think I'm going to go with The Seed Keeper by Diane Wilson. This was one of our read-along selections on the Book Cougars this year. Our theme was Indigenous Women Writers. And I remember seeing this cover, another beautiful cover. I saw the cover and I was like, oh, what is that book? And I am so happy we chose this. A lot of people make comparisons to this in um, Robin Walkimer's book. Braiding Sweetgrass. Right, yeah. which is a book we read the year before um, with Jenny from Reading Envy. And so I see your copy. Yes, this is one of my top 10, too. <laughs> <laughs> Let me get my notes. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, so this it's a story about uh, Rosalie Ironwing is her name. And she is an indigenous woman who was taken from her family as a child and raised in foster homes by white people and not raised very well. She is aimless and drifting, ends up being a temporary field hand for a, a white farmer. He's a young man whose parents have both passed and he's trying to make the farm work and they strike up a relationship. And I don't really want to give too much more information about it because I don't want to give any spoilers. That's already kind of a borderline spoiler, although it might say something like that on the back of the book. But what struck me so much about this is just how many different types of seed keepers there are in this world in particular that Diane Wilson's created. But it's usually, you know, women who protect the seeds so that the people will always have food wherever they are, wherever they're taken. And then she tells some stories. This is a contemporary novel, but she does tell some stories from like a, back in the 19th century or early 20th century when Native American people are forced off of their land and the women actually hide the seeds in their clothing so that they'll have them with them to, to have food eventually. But there's a lot in here about memory and family and what do you do when there's a huge disconnect between generations because stories weren't collected because people were torn apart either by the government or alcoholism. But it's a beautiful story overall. Emily, what do you have to add? Uh, you did a great job. I would just say I, I did want to let people know that we did talk with Diane Wilson, the author, on episode 165. And um, she is weaving the story of four Dakota women throughout the novel, and she does it incredibly seamlessly. Yes. Which is one of the things that I really loved about it. Is there anything else I well, want to add? Well, I mean, she talks, too, about the, you know, the indigenous people who are there living in Minnesota and the, and the white people who have built monuments to their 
ancestors who have taken, you know, taken the land. And yeah, I, you know, and I can't talk more about that without giving spoilers, yeah. you know. So. But I would say that she also does, there is a little bit of a history lesson there that doesn't feel forced also. Right. You know, she really does. The, the word weaving in was used a lot when we talked to our Zoom Zoom participants and when we talked to Diane Wilson. It was just, and, and this was her first time writing fiction, which yeah. she thought was going to be easy. And then she told right. us it was yeah. really hard because she had to make everything up. <laughs> right. Really so, hard. And, you yeah. know, she does a really good job of not, you know, she didn't want white farmers to be seen as enemies necessarily. You know, she knows about their struggles, too, from her professional work. The struggle to wanting to be a good steward of the land, but the the economic reality of farming in, in in a country where you have these huge farm conglomerates who are forcing farmers to use particular seeds and particular fertilizers and things like that. Yeah. She covered a lot of territory with yeah. that book. It's a great, great novel. The Seed Keeper by Diane Wilson. You two just crossed one off of each other's list. I know. <laughs> that usually doesn't happen. <laughs> Well, I did look at her stack when she brought it in, and I was like, oh, well, that's okay. <laughs> oh, maybe I'll sneak one in by the end. <laughs> or maybe you can you can do one of your... Um, the one I put on the floor yeah, here. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so when I put this list together, I always do think, like, oh, what would be the book I'd recommend to Chris? And what would be the book that I'd recommend to Emily from the list? And this is the one book that doesn't fall into that theme that I was talking about earlier, either tears or queer literature. And I don't even know if you've all have heard about it, but I feel like Chris would really enjoy this book for a, a, a myriad of reasons. But have either of you read The Change by Christine Miller? I have not, but I have an arc. Okay. So this is about three women that hit menopause. And when they hit menopause, they each get a power. And one of the women can speak to ghosts. One of them, and you find out that that's run in her family for generations. One of the women becomes immensely strong. And one of the women becomes sort of a witch. She becomes an herbalist. Uh, she can do things with plants. And you find out that these three women throughout history have sort of always come together to fight for women who are abused or, in this case, they run into a young girl who has been murdered and it's been sort of swept under the table, but because one of them can speak to the ghosts, they know that something happened. And so they start to investigate the rich and wealthy community and what's been going on. And it is about women taking ownership of their own power and going out into the world and getting shit done <laughs> like in its heart it's a murder mystery and you find out that it's has much more than this one girl at its heart but people are trying to stop them and there's all of these obstacles in the way and they are just they're not they're not going to let it stop them and it has this mystical piece to it but in the same time it's just like these women are going to solve this murder and you're going to get all of the intrigue and it brings in like the art world and it brings in the parties of these like this exclusive community where you can't get through the gate, but then you find out that there's been all of this stuff in the community going on just to protect people. It is. So I read it. I mean, it's a bigger book. Yeah, I think it looks it's, really uh, thick. It's 470 pages long, but I think I read it in a weekend. Wow. Like the pages just fly. The characters are fantastic. You want to know what's happening. You want them to get the bad guy. Every time you meet one of these men that you know has done something bad, you're just like, okay, ladies, let's let's get it done. <laughs> 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 and, you know, they go through ups and downs. You learn about them. You learn how they got where they are. And, you know, the, the, the sort of herbalist witch woman was very powerful in um, advertising. She was like, expected to take over this company and she was passed over for a man and so she decided to just flip the finger up and say goodbye and it turned out the company couldn't do anything without her and she wouldn't go back and you just it's all of this stuff about being taken for granted but then deciding you know what i'm not going to give you what you need i'm going to get what i need and then it's a murder mystery so Whoa. add that to the whole thing <laughs> i it want is to read that <laughs> It's so good. You'll just fly through the pages. It's called The Change by Kristen Miller. 
it says, and I love that they get it after menopause too. It's just like this great sort of metaphor. And at the bottom, it says, it's not over, it's time. <laughs> That's great. What power would you well, want, Chris? <laughs> I don't know. I'd, I have to. I'd have to think about that. Maybe the power to have whatever power I wanted. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> whatever On I any needed given it. day. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks, Russell, for for talking about that book because, as I said, I have an arc, but I think the size, you know, kind of held me back a little bit. But it, that one has just gone towards the top of my TBR. So. Um, and you all know, I said this last year and this is still me. I listen to the audio when I read, it's a fantastic audio book too. Mm. So if you want to go that way, cause it's a, you know, a little bit of a junkster, it's definitely worth listening to as well. Nice. Now your books, all of the books on your list are published in 2022. You know what? I think so. Okay. Which is really weird for me, but, um, yeah, no, this was a year where I got so many books sent to me that I didn't have a much opportunity to go back list. Okay, mm -hmm. just just double checking. Yeah. yeah. All right. I think everything is 2022 or late 2021. Okay. Yeah, we wanted to remind people, I think we said this at the beginning, that these are, these are our top reads of this year, but they didn't necessarily come out in this year. For example, this one I'm about to talk about comes out the day this podcast airs. <laughs> So I read it a little bit early. This comes out on January 3rd. It's called Night Wherever We Go by Tracy Rose Payton. I don't know if you've heard about this one, Russell, out from Echo. And this is about enslaved women. It's 1852. And we've got a group of six enslaved women that are on a plantation in Texas. The slave owners are not doing very well as farmers. And so they're looking at everything they own, including the human beings, which is horrible, as a way to make money. And so they decide that one of the ways they can make money is if these enslaved women start having children, because then they can sell their children. And the women take it upon themselves to gain autonomy over their bodies by figuring out a way that they cannot get pregnant. And I don't want to say much more than that, because it would spoil the unfolding of the book. What I will say that I loved about this is I think it's similar to what you were saying, Russell, about your first book is it came from an angle that I've never read before talking about enslaved people and this group of women bonding together and what they had to do to overcome. And I learned a lot reading this book. I mean, I had to stop a lot and look things up and um, just understand some of the things that the author was talking about. I'm ho very hopeful that this book is going to do well. This is a debut novel for her. I'd never heard of Tracy Rose Payton before. Elizabeth McCracken, who is a very well thought of author on the cover, just says extraordinary. So I highly recommend. Again, it's called Night Wherever We Go by Tracy Rose Payton. Well, a little synchronicity I'm currently reading How the Word is Passed by Clint Smith. Mm -hmm. And he talks about on the chapter of Monticello, he he goes to different locations where people were enslaved in American history and where that history is still be, be now being taught or used as a tool to teach. And, um, and on the Monticello chapter, he talks about Jefferson and how Jefferson did sell people that he enslaved when he needed that money. And there are also letters where he talks about how, you know, if a, a, a married couple that he's enslaved produce a child every two years, that is better economically than the whole crop yield of one able-bodied man who is mm -hmm. he's enslaved, you know? So the fiction is really right in line with the facts. You yeah. Know? So... Yeah, and I mean, on the back, Kesey Lemon, I can never say his name correctly, says that it has the potential to change how blackness, Texas, and the nation are written about forever. Wow. And I think that's true. I mean, I think, and I think Clint Smith, the same thing. It's like forcing a rethinking of how these stories have been told in the past. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he even, uh, you know, well, I won't go on on that since I'm reading it currently, but he does talk about how, at least in that Monticello chapter, he was surprised by the docent who was leading the tour. Mm. So, yeah. Oh. Well, my next book is one that Russell recommended. 
I read a couple years ago, or maybe it was just last year, I'm not really sure. My Autobiography of Carson McCullers by Jen Chaplin. Oh my God. <laughs> After I read this, I said to Emily, I will read every single book that Russell ever recommends to me going forward. <laughs> Which is why change just went up on her list. Yes. <laughs> Very different. Yes. <laughs> Very different. <laughs> well, this book, wow. I, you know, I remember when it first came out, seeing people talk about it, and I thought, oh, that sounds kind of like kitschy or something. I'm not really sure what I thought. I love this book so much. So it's about Jen, who's working um, in an archive, and she starts working with Carson McCullers' clothing and reading some of her letters and, and novels. And so in her research then that takes her to McCullers' homes, she starts seeing parallels with her own life um, as a queer woman, as a writer, as a woman with physical challenges. And it blew my mind. It really did. I thought it was such a unique way of storytelling and incorporating archives and writing about a writer's life. You know, she's sharing her own life, but she's also then reclaiming McCullers' life, who was presented, you know, as this straight white woman when she was really, she was really queer as hell. I'll say that. And so, and it's all right there, right? It's right there kind of in plain sight, but just how queer lives get whitewashed. Yeah, um, I mean, absolutely. I think that that's what she talks about, right? The fact that it just get gets put, it got put under the table so that people didn't talk about it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, so many things she makes parallels to uh, Carson's own life and how things were covered up about her own family and, you know, just accepted by the media and, and other people. So I, I just love this. I downloaded the, you know, how you can do the first 20% on um, the Kindle to get the preview mm -hmm. I usually read on my Kindle at bedtime and I was looking around for something to read. And I thought, well, I'll try this. And oh my God, I whipped through that. I bought it immediately and like finished it probably the next day, I think. And now I have the hardcover and I'm going to be reading it again soon. So thank you, Russell, for that great recommendation. That again was my autobiography of Carson McCullers by Jen Chaplin. And it is a memoir. It's like memoir slash literary history. Absolutely. I think it's so cool that publishers are putting books like that out because, you know, sometimes when they can't check the right box or, you know, know where to shelve it in the bookstore, mm -hmm. you know, right. they don't get published. So, yeah, you know, and it was shortlisted for the National Book Award, I do believe, in nonfiction and very rarely do memoir ish type things make it on that list. So mm. Carson McCullers and your hero, um, Willa Cather. Uh, have had their history straight washed a little bit and finally it's all coming out right yeah for sure her emily dickinson too and so many other writers yeah yeah absolutely oh well i'm glad i feel like my job is done and i should just leave because i don't <laughs> i can never um beat that recommendation so the next book on my list is actually by an author that probably everyone's talked about but it was his second novel it's young mungo by douglas stewart he won the booker prize for shuggy bane and i have a controversial hot take i did not care for shuggy bane it was not it was fine i thought it was an absolutely fine book i was blown away by Young Mungo. It was everything I wanted Shuggy Bane to be. <laughs> so it's still in the same world. We're still in um, Glasgow. We're still dealing with the Protestant versus Catholic issue. And our, we have a young boy who at the start of the book is being sent away by his mother because something has happened. And he's been being sent away with these two men she knows from AA to go into the forest and man up. Mm. And what happens is the book goes back and forth and tells you about what happens once he leaves and goes on this. And these men that the mom knows nothing about other than they said that they would take this boy. Um, 
for all the wrong reasons. And then it flips back in history and you learn how young Mungo and his, Mungo and his family came into being, how his mother has always dealt with alcoholism, disappeared, his sister has had to raise him. His brother sort of runs the local Protestant gang. And one day he meets a Catholic boy. He meets a Catholic boy in a, and I don't know the word for it, but he, <laughs> this Catholic boy has a house of pigeons. He collects pigeons and they became a friendship, which becomes more than a friendship, but there's all of these obstacles in the way. And so what's happening is the history is leading up to the event that gets us to the point where he is banished by his mother with these men. And then he's on this trip with these men and things start to happen. Um, trigger warning, though, I mean, alcoholism, child abuse, all of that. But Douglas Stewart's utter brilliance at tackling these difficult topics with so much despair in every part of it to leave you with any sense of hope takes a master. And I was sobbing at the end of this book. Like, tears down the face could not stop um, I think it's beautiful. I think it's just fantastic. Um, you learn a lot. He's very good at teaching you about what's going on in Scotland and the, the religious strife and all of that, the economic issues. But he's also in this book, he just creates characters that you just want to save. Mm. Um, I cannot recommend it enough. I feel bad because I feel like he had just won the booker. So young Mungo was going to always fail in comparison to the book that won the booker. Mm -hmm. But in my mind, it is a stronger, better book. Hmm. That's interesting. I wonder also if it had been written before or if it was written after. You know what I mean? You know, I saw him speak in person. He actually came to the Bay Area. I believe it was written sort of simultaneously parts of it. Hmm. Okay. Um, very similar, you know, young gay youth, alcoholic mother. They both sort of have those same exact themes. But in this one, he just makes his main character a little bit more complete. Mm. Hmm. Well, I'm going to take us out of the depths of despair <laughs> <laughs> into one that just was just fun. And I, I went back and forth about whether I wanted to talk about this, not because it didn't make my top 10. It definitely did. But I just feel like it has been talked about a lot. But there you have it. It's called Lessons in Chemistry by Bonnie Garmus. Bonnie Garmus is a 64-year-old debut novelist, which I'm like, woohoo! We know what her superpower is after the change. <laughs> <laughs> and it's um, it has a very recognizable cover. It's bright orange with a woman with I think it's like a pencil behind her ear and I just the caught the cover every time I saw it in the library I was like okay I've got to read this book and it's about Elizabeth Zott who is a chemist it's the 60s so you know women weren't necessarily allowed to lead first with their brains and she's working at a business where they kind of put her off and make her a secretary and she meets a chemist who works there who's revered, literally world-renowned chemist. They fall in love. She gets pregnant. So because she gets pregnant, she has to leave her job because in the 60s, you weren't allowed to be pregnant and have a job. She decides there are other things that happen that I don't want to spoil, but she ends up becoming a TV personality on a cooking show where she through she teaches cooking, which is essentially chemistry and life lessons. It's charming. It's poignant. It's also historically interesting because, you know, it made me very happy to be living in the time I live in today, which still isn't perfect for women's rights. And, um, and it's feminist. It's a very feminist novel, which I really appreciated. The other thing that's very cute about it and charming is that some of the chapters are written from the point of view of 630, who is her dog. His name is 630. It's very sweet. And and from his perspective of how he's seeing things go. So I highly recommend it. I did not um, listen to the audio, so I don't know what that's like. I'd be curious. But it's a page turner, very fast read. And it has been optioned, I think, as a series for Apple TV or something like that. So should be fun to see what they do with it. I can totally see it on the television. I'm especially curious about how they'll do the cooking show. 
Nice. I, I believe, Emily, that's Barnes and Noble's book of the year. Oh, really? And um, when the I have that arc, and when it came, it came with pencils. Oh, how fun! I loved it, except I don't own a pencil sharpener. <laughs> <laughs> so like, I have these pencils, and I'm like, oh. go to your local library. Or the dollar store, and you can solve that problem. <laughs> or even the grocery store, and they're they'll have pencil sharpeners there. And they're I know I just don't, I don't I don't handwrite anything anymore. Oh. So it's so crazy. I I loved the idea of it. So that's really it sweet. I want to see what the pencils look like. If you still have them, oh, they're in the other room. Me, Yeah, send me a picture. I'm curious. How lucky are you? That's so fun. It was just a fun, like just a fun read. I I loved it. That's cool. So we're taking a quick break from our conversation with Russell to introduce a sponsorship ad. We're really committed to not having advertisement on the podcast, but we are starting to branch out and experiment with sponsorships. And Emily is going to read our first with a name that might be familiar to some of our longtime listeners. Shuli Kaywood's story collection, A Small Thing to Want, has won the independent publisher bronze medal for short fiction. Dayton Daily News called it, the most exceptional short story collection in quite some time. And BuzzFeed News said the stories are beautifully crafted and dig deep into the realities of family life. Signed copies on sale now at tinyurl.com slash a small thing to want. We talked to Shuli about this short story collection on episode 100, if you want to give that a listen. And all of these links are available in the show notes. All right. Well, my next book is called The Barons, and it's by Kurt Johnson and Ellie Johnson, a father and daughter team. Oh, you know, what I liked about this book is that it's it starts two women, they're lovers, they're college age. They go off on this canoe trip into the Barrens up north in Canada, and it's really remote. You're supposed to have, you know, a permit to be able to go up there so that they know that you're there. They don't do any of these things. One woman is skilled, one is not so much. This is not too much of a spoiler because it's on the back of the book, I believe, but one of them dies. <laughs> and the other one is left to trudge along down this river to try to get back to civilization with her lover's dead body. And along the way, you get all of the, her, her backstory of what her childhood was like. And she grew up in, I th- in Nebraska with a father who was kind of like a survivalist anti-society kind of person and i just love outdoor stories and there's not a ton with women um honorable mention to small game by blair braverman which was another one this year that was fantastic and then there's alice henderson's a uh, a ghost of caribou is another one that came out this year so kick-ass women who are doing outdoorsy things Sneak in an extra title. Yep, there she goes. Well, (laughs) sneaking in extra titles. I can't say anything because I did it early. She waited a while. (laughs) Yes, I I waited for you to do that first. So um, that was The Barons by Kurt Johnson and Ellie Johnson. And that should come out this year, 2022. I love that it's a father daughter authors, too. That's really fun. Yeah, totally. Cool. So um, my next book is my Emily book. And I've already actually talked about this book a little bit with y'all when I was here for the Booker Prize. But Maps of Our Spectacular Bodies by Maddie Mortimer is a debut novel by a British um, author. It was long listed for the Booker Prize. And it's one of those books that has never left my thoughts. Mm. So it is the story of a family, a mother, a father, and a daughter, The mother is a cancer survivor in the past, but she has a re-diagnosis. And this time it doesn't look great. And so half of the book is this family dealing with the fact that the mom is sick and she's not going to make it. And we learn not only about the dynamic of the family currently and sort of how they deal with and move forward, we go back to figure out how they've all gotten there, how where the daughter really came from and how the family came together and all of those pieces. The other part of the book is cancer has its own voice. Mm. And cancer talks about what it's doing in her body as it goes along. And it is pure 
poetry. It is horrifying and it is real, but there's a science to it. There's like a nature. In a lot of words, it's cancer's doing the job that it does. And you sort of like come to respect the fact that it, in, it, cancer is an amazingly horrible thing. And it sort of becomes this villain. So you sort of get a moment from, of reprieve from the, the, the sort of the grief to sort of focus on the villain hmm. and just listen as she tells you, like, there's not a whole lot you can do, but live life before it ends. Wow. And it is touching and beautiful. And she does a lot of stuff with structure and style. You see, she does like weird things. Let me see if I can get to Ooh, that. Like, I love that stuff. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and um, it just gives the whole, like we've all read sort of like the cancer diagnosis story, but she sort of flips it into this idea of like, how do you really live through that? And what is the other side? And it's just really, really well done. It's moving. It's definitely in the tears category. Um, but it's just, it's about family and love and saying goodbye, and but enjoying the time you have. Wow. Wow. So I wonder if she's a poet. Because um, listeners, what Russell showed us, the page he showed us just kind of looked a little bit like poetry, the way it was written. So that'd be interesting. Yeah, you know, it's her first novel. She was mm -hmm. born in 1996. Holy moly's. My kid's age. <laughs> wow. So some of us were in college. Some of us were out of college. But um, can you tell us that title again, please? It's called Maps of Our Spectacular Bodies by Maddie Mortimer. What a great title. Holy it smokes. is in the cover. And I apologize. You know, I'm a booktuber. So I think holding it up to the screen is going to be enough. I forget. <laughs> that I'm a guest on a podcast. But the cover itself yeah, beautiful. is just gorgeous. Mm. Wow. Is that like a body in a bathing suit? It bent is. Over? It's okay. a body. It's actually like in, I don't know if it's just the color blocking of it. I don't, she may be nude, mm -hmm. um, but it looks like clothes in a way too. But it almost looks like she's sitting on a table in a doctor's office or something. Yeah, yeah. something okay. like that. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Got it. Oh. Wow. Yeah, it is. And did you yeah. listen to that one? How was it on audio? I did. It is a good audio, but okay. I highly recommend reading it because what she does on the page is so important mm. yeah. to the narrative. Okay. Very good. Well, I have a pair of books I'm going to talk about next. Of course you do. <laughs> She's cheating more. <laughs> <laughs> These are books three and four in the Amgash series by Elizabeth Strout, O. William, and Lucy by the Sea. The first two books in the series are um, My Name is Lucy Barton and Anything is Possible. So I just mentioned four books, but I'm just going to talk about books three and four. Um, these books are, I mean, this, I don't use this word very often, but perfection. I mean, Elizabeth Strout is just an amazing writer. She truly is very spare, beautiful, and she has an amazing way to capture um, relationship and how people relate to each other. And these books are book, book, the first book or the third book in the series, and they call it a series. I don't know why it's not really a series, except that Lucy Barton is in each of the books. But O. William is when her husband, who is now her ex-husband, asks her to go on a trip with her to Maine to investigate something that's come up in his family that he didn't know about. It's a bit of a mystery. So they go on a ride together and are just Lucy and William together. That's the best thing I can say. And I, I think I talked about this when I talked about the book on the an earlier episode that My Name is Lucy Barton was a play on Broadway starring Laura Linney, a one woman show. We went to see it. We were very lucky. And um, Elizabeth Strout was at a rehearsal and Laura Linney was trying to get into character. And at one point she's talking to herself and she says she's talking to William, her husband. And Elizabeth Strout says, oh, William, like I need to write more about William because he doesn't in the, my name is Lucy Barton. Like, you know, she's in the hospital and she mentions her husband. We know she has a husband. We know she has children at home, but it's really about her interactions with her mom, the whole 
story, right? right? Yeah. So when Laura Linney's trying to get into character and like talking to her husband, Elizabeth Stroud's like, right, William, like I should, you know, what is his backstory? Who is he? And so she writes this book and it's about him and his relationship with Lucy, but also him discovering some of his family history. And then in Lucy by the Sea, we're now in pandemic times and she's really writing about that. And William is a scientist. So he, Lucy is living in an apartment in Manhattan and he gets in touch with her and he's like, yeah, no, we have to get out of here. Like, this is not going to go well. And they rent a house on the short coast of Maine and end up spending, you know, what they think is going to be a short time and ends up being a very long time. And it's just a reflection on what that time was like, what it was like to be away from her children, what her children were going through. And it's really amazing, like very spare short novels that just tell a gripping story. So again, those are O. William and Lucy by the Sea by Elizabeth Strout. I always say Elizabeth Strout's one of those authors that when I read her, I'm always like, she is brilliant. Mm -hmm. But then I never like pick her up. Like I always ask myself why I haven't read more by her. Mm -hmm. And then when I'm reading her, I'm like, I'm in the hands of a master. Mm -hmm. Like you're exact. It's, it's so it's sparse, but every word is perfect. Yeah. And what she can do in a few words, many writers can't do in 10 pages. Yep. And she uses really interesting style also, like lots of colons and kind of talks to you as the reader, which could be annoying, but it's not, (laughs) you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think I've read everything by her, but I should check that. Um, I thought all of Kittredge and all of again were just brilliant as well. So highly I've read those. I've read My Name is Lucy Barton and I've read O. William. I haven't read Anything is Possible or Lucy by the Sea, though I have both of them at home. I think she has one other book maybe out there. Yeah, it was it's got two women's names, which I can't think of. And I think it was one of her earlier ones, and that was good too. Hmm. Yeah, I'm like Russell. I mean I I mean I've only read My Name is Lucy Barton, but when Emily talks about her novels, like I always feel like, Oh, I need to read those. I need to read but I haven't. But I want to. Yes, yeah. really good. Well, my next book will be, no one will be surprised by this one, Shudder by Ramona Emerson. Love this novel. It was a debut novel, came out this summer, and it, it it's just a fantastic novel. It's one of those that's hard to categorize. It's a bit horror. It's a thriller. It's coming of age. It's about a indigenous woman who is working um, for the Albuquerque Police Department as a photographer of crime scenes and accident scenes who can see ghosts. And the first chapter, the opening chapter, is really intense. And, you know, you get a feel in that chapter for the, the gruesomeness of the work that she does and then the interactions with ghosts. I just thought it was... So it was one of the books that I read this year that I couldn't stop reading. And I was really resentful anytime I had to put it down and go do something, you know, really enjoyed it. I think it was a crime that on Goodreads, it didn't, it didn't even make some of the lists on Goodreads, Mm -hmm. but it has a lot of authenticity. Um, Ramona herself is indigenous. So I'll just leave it at that. I mean, great generational stuff, uh, intergenerational relationships and coming of age story because you do get some of the characters backstory if you're looking for a gripping read by a a brand new author who is working on her second novel as we speak um, check it out shutter by ramona emerson the fourth book i'm going to talk about is a wisp of a of a book oh this is my only one not written in 2022 address unknown by katherine cressman taylor This was reissued by Echo, I want to say last year. So this was originally written as a story in in 1938 and published in Story Magazine. Hmm. And it is epistolary. Mm -hmm. So it's set during World War II, and it is letters between two men. So they know each other. They own an art museum in New York. One is Jewish, one is not. The one who is not Jewish returns to Germany to expand sort of their art empire. So it starts with these relationships of these two men writing letters back and forth as friends, as um, colleagues. 
And then World War II happens and Nazism takes over and the tone of the letters change. And you start to see it affect this relationship. And what happens is the Jewish man has a sister who's in Austria and he asks a favor of the man in Germany and the man in Germany declines. So he decides to say no and then the letters turn. And what address unknown is, is what would happen during World War II when someone would disappear and you'd write a letter to Germany, you'd get something back that said address unknown. Mm -hmm. And this book, it, it is literally 60 pages. Your jaw will drop. Your heart will break. You will stop it and you will start over again. And the reason the author wrote it is she didn't think enough Americans were taking seriously enough what was going on in Germany. And she wanted to point out what Nazis were doing to those who spoke out against them, to Jewish people, to people that were um, made to disappear. So it's called Address Unknown by Catherine Cressman Taylor. It, it was just reissued by Echo. And yeah, it was... Mm. Looking fantastic. I love an epistolary novel. Wow. Sounds You'll great. read it in like 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> wow. wow. That short. Well, my next book is The Swimmers by Julie Atsuka. This too is a slim novel, just under 200 pages. And it's about a group of swimmers at a local public swimming pool, kind of in the inner sanctum down below in the basement of a building. And the beginning of the book is told from the perspective of we, like we as the group, but they get to know each other and their little quirks and idiosyncrasies. And then slowly over time, a crack develops in the bottom of the pool. And the next part of the book at about 40%, it changes perspective and is told from the point of view of a she and follows one of the swimmers who's an older woman and follows her through the haze of her dementia. So this crack in the pole becomes a metaphor for disease and life, etc. And it's her daughter is also in the book trying to figure out how to handle this situation with her mom. I had never read a Julie Atsuka book. I know there are people who are just, I think this was her third novel, um, people just were waiting anxiously for this one to arrive, and uh, it did not disappoint. Again, that's called The Swimmers by Julie Atsuka. I do think that first 40% of that book is darn near perfect. Mm -hmm. So my next book is one that I thought I had read, but I hadn't. It is Mansfield Park by Jane Austen. Published my favorite Jane Austen! <laughs> Eight, oh my god well so it published in 1814 and you know i thought i had read all of jane austen's novels and you know i went around saying that for years and then the mooks and the gripes were talking about it on a podcast episode earlier this year and i was like what like that doesn't sound familiar at all and then i thought well i better investigate this and apparently i had not read it um so i enjoyed it very much I know a lot of people are kind of on the fence about this one. Not too many people consider it a favorite Jane Austen novel. It's about a young girl whose parents are poor. Let's put it that way. Dad's an alcoholic, a bunch of kids in the house. Um, but the mother's sister married well into this wealthy family. And instead of taking one of the sons, the wealthy family takes the oldest daughter, the eldest daughter to go live with them. And so it's about her experience going from this one type of family situation to this other. And you learn that this wealth that this family has created is based in part on slavery, which, you know, a lot of people have said Jane Austen doesn't really talk about slavery. And then when you bring up this book, they say, well, she didn't talk about it enough. <laughs> and it's just, you know, I think uh, there were some great movie adaptations of this that really highlight the slavery. The son of the wealthy man is having a hard time at life. He's an alcoholic, budding alcoholic. 
And one of the movie adaptations makes it pretty clear that, you know, part of his issue is the trauma he experienced of going to the plantations and seeing what was going on. In the book, I don't think it's as clear cut, but you can definitely see that, I think. Russell is nodding in agreement. I would say, you know, Mansfield Park is dark. It's darker than any other Jane Austen, which is usually a more a lighter and a little more, she's just more sharp, right? More snide. This one comes, I think, for her, it's more heavy. And I think that's why people struggle with it. It's not, it doesn't sort of fit the Jane Austen mold. But to me, it it's like that book she wrote that sort of said that she could do other things. If that makes sense. Like it was her book that just said, I'm not only this, I can do this and really make a social commentary. But she, like all uh, great authors, expects us to know a little bit. And so she's like, she challenges you as a reader. And I, I just love that about that book. Yeah, well, so. and there's some historically, she represents some things that her contemporary audience would have known. Whereas we, you know, 100, 200 years later, don't understand what that context is. You know, that that's one of the reasons I love literary history, too. And, and history is because it gives you context for some of the older books sometimes. Yeah, I, I think all of Jane Austen's novels are full of social commentary and satire. And I think they could be read at multiple levels. You can get the darkness if you want to, but it definitely is heavier in this book. It's more blatant, I guess. Yeah, that may be a good word. Yeah, um, but I really enjoyed it. I don't think it's my favorite. Well, I know it's not my favorite Jane Austen, but I'm very happy I finally read it. And I can say with full confidence that I have read all of Jane Austen's novels. <laughs> I think I haven't read one. So I think I said before it started, I'm into my top three. And these books could go in any order on any given day. So I'm going to put them in the order that I put them in for the podcast, but they could fluctuate. So book uh, number three is Trust mm. by Hernan Diaz. This copy was very kindly signed by Hernan and sent to me by the amazing Emily with this adorable postcard that I <laughs> am keeping in it on my shelf. So Hernan Diaz has written two books. Um, and the first book he wrote, which is In the Distance, was shortlisted for the Pulitzer. And then this book came out, and I am surprised it has not won every award. But this is a book about money, and it's told in four sections. The Each section is its own literary device. <laughs> the first section is a novel about a rich man, and basically a novelization of how this man has accumulated his wealth. The second section is an autobiography where the man that that book was supposedly about responds. And so you learn about sort of the facts that made the fiction. The third section is a memoir written by a woman who worked for the rich man. And you get more and more layers of this world, this world of money. And the fourth section is the man's wife's journals while she's in hospital. Hernan Diaz does two things here. One, he breaks down this idea of how we accumulate wealth in America and this I, and sort of the stigma and also the um, hurrah that's given to people that can sort of find ways to make money out of nothing, right? And he talks about very scientifically how this man, this main character, is able to sort of just analyze the market, make smart decisions, and accumulate wealth, and make it through all of these difficult challenges. It starts in the 1920s, and it goes through, I think, like the 1950s. I can't remember the end. I apologize. I read it a while ago. It's one of those books where each section layers on the previous section. So what you thought you knew is then thrown away because it's oh, this is really what happened. Mm. And then you get to the next section and you find out, oh, that's not really what happened. That was that person's perspective on what happened. And by the end, it all comes down to this wife who will, in her journals, make it all sort of not make sense, but make sense at the same time. Mm. To me, it's, it's a classic. I think this book will be read for decades to come. I think it's stylistically challenging. I think it is as American as a novel can get. We are fascinated with the idea of money in this country. We cannot live without it. 
and we glorify people who can make it at the expense of all others. And I think he does a fantastic job. And each section is like written in a different way. You think like you're reading a Wharton novel in the beginning and then, you know, you move through. Um, it is so good. So good. Yeah, it scares me a little bit. I really, I mean, I think partly because we heard him speak, you know, when we when we got that copy of that book for you, and I was like, oh my god, this is so smart. Yes, I remember <laughs> you saying that. Yeah, and then also I just thought like it has a little not time space continuum stuff, which does make my brain explode, but it just sounded very complicated. But if they're distinctly different, you know, sections, maybe my mind can do it. I'm going to try. Yeah, they don't overlap each other. Um, and you just start to put the pieces together of who's mm -hmm. who in each section. Yeah. And the final three sections are all sort of meta nonfiction, right? Mm -hmm. They're actual. The first one is the only piece of fiction. Mm -hmm. And then the others really are just the same people from different perspectives. Yeah. Can so. you imagine on a sidebar being like your debut novel, almost winning the Pulitzer? That's amazing. Yeah, a lot of pressure. I know. But then he, he, it seems like he rose to the challenge and came back with another really great book. So. Yeah. so my next book is In Love, A Memoir of Love and Loss by Amy Bloom. You know, I have to say when I was looking over my list of all of the books I've read this year, I was quite disappointed in myself that I haven't read much nonfiction, but I did read a ton of memoir. So mm -hmm. that made me feel less bad. But so this is one of the memoirs that we read together for the book Cougars. Yeah, I love this one, too. And I knew it was going to be on your list. So I knew <laughs> I could not put it on mine and still have it be on the episode. Yes. And um, we did get the chance to talk to the author Amy Bloom on episode 153, which was a highlight of my year. This book was just really meaningful to me to read. It's about Amy's experience with her husband, Brian, as they discover that even though he's quite young in his early 60s, he's been being diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And he was always like this larger than life character. And he says very clearly from the beginning, I am not going to live long with this illness. I want to take matters into my own hands and then turns to his lovely wife and says, and you will figure this out for me, which she does with um, grace, but also with her being who she is, you know, which is one of the things I loved about the book, even at the end where he's close to death and she's rolling her eyes, you know, at him because of how he's talking, which I could totally relate to. So um, she seamlessly kind of weaves their love story because they met very late in life in their, I think, early 50s, as well as, you know, helping you understand who Brian is, how they relate to each other, how that relationship has changed as she at first just thinks he's kind of becoming, an, you know, a troublesome husband, but really he, there's a disease that's affecting his brain. And then, you know, them coming to terms with the fact that choosing to end one end one's life is not something that we do well in our country. So they end up um, investigating and going to Switzerland to learn about Dignitas, which is an organization that allows a person to take matters into their own hands. And um, I listened to both the audio and read the book. Amy Bloom narrates. She has a lovely voice. Mm -hmm. Boy, she also wrote this book very soon after going through this experience. There were a couple points in the audiobook where you can really hear her voice almost break, you know, as she's reading and reflecting on uh, the experience. I mean, it's just a very deep love story, you know, and it's painful to read. You know how it's going to end. Um, but I just think it's very much a brave story. It's a brave love story. And, you know, the way she talks about Alzheimer's too, is that, you know, it's not just, you know, you're not losing your memory. You are no longer able to figure some things out. Cause one of the scenes that I remember, um, he had a job where he had to do some photocopies or something and he couldn't figure out the photocopy machine and they kept telling him and he just couldn't do it. And, he was an engineer or something like that. So like that was a huge red flag that something was going on with his brain. Right. Um, and I think, you know, in part she wrote it so people understand what Alzheimer's is. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, the, the lack of 
options that we have in this country. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And because Brian told her she had to. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. No, it was a beautiful book. I listened to the audio and read it as well. And uh, really, you know, it's one of those books. I'm happy to have read it. You can't exactly say you enjoyed it, though, right? I don't yeah. know. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah. It's an odd one to say, I, you know, I loved it. It was a wonderful book. I mean, it was wow. very sad and poignant, but brave, incredibly brave Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Again, that was called In Love, A Memoir of Love and Loss by Amy Bloom. Well, my next pick is an anthology of stories by Constance Fenimore Wilson, Miss Grief and Other Stories. It was edited by Anne Boyd Rue forward by Calm Tobin. And I love these stories so much, um, showing Russell the book. Constance Fenimore Wilson was a 19th century American woman writer who was hugely popular, considered like the Jane Austen of her day in American letters and was largely forgotten. Um, She was a friend of Henry James and she died pretty young, possibly by suicide. She fell out of a window and Henry James's reputation just kind of overshadowed her after her death is one of the theories. Um, but these stories, she was from the Midwest and uh, she started writing, I think it was like in the late 1860s. And this collection, Anne Boyd Rude pulled out three different regions that she wrote about the Midwest, the South, and then Europe because uh, Wilson spent like the last 15 years maybe of her life in Europe as an expatriate. I love these stories because they have such a great sense of place and time and wonderful characters. And I highly recommend them. I highly recommend this collection. There's also a Library of America collection with more stories. And then um, Anne Boyd Rue also wrote a biography of Wilson, which I plan on reading. I was going to read it this year. I just didn't get to it, but it's on my list for 2023. So again, that's Miss Grief and Other Stories by Constance Fenimore Wilson. Sneaking in extra books yet again. (laughs) (laughs) Chris, have you ever heard of the press Dean Street Press? I have. I feel like that is a world you would live in. So they champion books by women from the 40s and 50s that may have been unpublished. They have a whole entire section of mysteries by women from those ages, that, and they just republish them. Oh, nice. um, I read a number of books from them. I just feel like you'd find a lot of stuff there that would be right up your alley. All right. I will scope them out. <laughs> I have heard of and it, they but are, you know. Fantastic. I think they have a location here in San Francisco, but Mm. they're really easy to get a hold of. And all their stuff is very, it's all paperback. So it's very inexpensive, but very good. The next book for me is The Trees by Percival Everett. I feel like this book has been talked about a ton. So I don't know that I need to go into it, but it's, you know, shortlisted for the book or Percival was shortlisted for the a Pulitzer a few years ago for his book Telephone. I think he's one of those American writers that all writers read, but not enough people read, American readers read. The Trees is a satire based around the idea of these murders that are going on where these white men and women are being killed and their bodies are left with uh, the body of a dead black man. And he looks like Emmett Till the young man that was killed decades ago. And there's an uproar reaction. This book takes place in Money, Mississippi, and these people come in, and the intention is to figure out who's doing these killings. And the book continues to get more and more absurd in the in these murders that are going on. Because it's this idea that the man is being killed by the dead man that's in the room, or the woman that's being killed is by the dead man in the room. This book is all about the I, the fact that there is so much that goes on in marginalized communities where people are killed constantly that never makes the news and no one really ever looks into any of it. But if you flip it and you make the murder victim a white man, the world comes a running, mm. right? And as the, the book gets more and more absurd, you realize the absurdity of this and how 
this does, ha it happens every single day in America. These deaths of these people are just washed under. And unless they're caught on camera or someone's paying attention, no one will even talk about it. So he does a fantastic job of being satirical, dark, darkly, darkly satirical, and taking us to task. But in the same time, writing a page turner of a book, you want to know who's doing what and why. Um, and the characters are fat. And at times it's like laugh out loud funny, but you don't know why you're laughing. Mm -hmm. But you realize that it will make you think about the world we live in in a very different way. Again, this is another classic, I think. I just think the trees will probably be read forever. If you haven't read Percival ever, every single one of his books is so vastly different. Um, but he's one of those people that I think more people need to read. So hopefully that did enough to sell it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it makes me think, I can't remember the author's name, but I read a, it was a memoir about the Cicero race riots um, in the fifties. And the author talked and she's an African American woman um, from the Chicago area she talked about how, you know, her family, uh, you know, little older generations would say if there was a problem and you needed a police officer, you would say there's a white person. And if you really needed help, you would say there was a white woman being raped and that would get the cops to come and help. Mm. Otherwise, they just wouldn't. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Wow, that one sounds really heavy. It does, but it sounds really good. Yeah, I have to does. say, I yeah. mean, really different. Yeah. Well, once again, I'm going to follow Russell and do a little uplifting. <laughs> Talk I had about a very <laughs> down year. I apologize. <laughs> like, I feel like I did do a lot of heavy topics. Well, you said you said tears and queers, but I'm hearing a lot more tears. <laughs> There's a lot of gay people in a lot of these books too. So. <laughs> There's just a lot of tears. Yeah, well. they just all sound sad. Um, my last book, because uh, I'm going to pass on the next round since I had a, a, a duplicate of Chris, is Simply Julia, which is a cookbook. Julia Tertian, 110 Recipes for Healthy Comfort Food. I've talked about this on the podcast before. This is the one that I just went back to and back to all year long. Um, her theme, like... She has a newsletter that's called Keep Calm and Cook On. So that kind of gives you the idea that she just is like nonplussed by things. And her cookbook is representative of that. So she'll say, you know, like, oh, if you don't have that ingredient, just use that ingredient. You know, it's not really fussy or special. There's not 20 ingredients per recipe. A lot of them have like four ingredients, which I loved. And um, it's also a cookbook that I've just read because she offers a lot of very cool advice and interesting lists of things and how to keep your pantry and, you know, cooking techniques. I really enjoyed it. And she also has cooking classes every Sunday at two o'clock. Wow. Yeah. Which you can zoom in or if you pay to attend the class, you can also just get the zoom afterwards and have access to it. She sends you a grocery list all you know segmented out it's really easy to shop based on her list it's what i'm going to do for my birthday this year nice is cook with julia so she also has a great name right for a cook right so, um so again that's called simply julia 110 recipes for healthy comfort food eat on everybody <laughs> <laughs> So my next book is another nonfiction, The Warmth of Other Suns, The Epic Story of America's Great Migration by Isabel Wilkerson. And this book came out in 2010. It's one of those that I've always kind of wanted to read, but it's big. It is a thick book, but this was the year. Um, and it took me a while to, to get through it, but I'm so happy I read it. What makes this book so unique is one, it's talking about the Great Migration as it was the first book that really tackled the topic. And it was such a huge, huge migration and shift in American culture um, that it's, you know, surprising to her that no one had really written about it before. But basically, the Great Migration started around World War One and went to maybe even the 70s, where a lot of African American Southerners moved north to the Midwest or West out towards California and just the impact. Um, 
Well, not so much of the impact, the aftermath. She doesn't go into great detail about that. This is more about the reasons why people left and what their experiences were. So she follows three different people from different states going to different areas. And you have their stories interspersed with more historic, you know, traditionally historical chapters and information. So that combination of the narrative with the history really makes for great reading. And I highly recommend it. It might take you a while. Some people like whip right through it. For me, it wasn't that kind of whip right through it. But it was a book that really changed the way I think about American culture and American history. Again, The Warmth of Other Suns by Isabel Wilkerson. I love that book. I highly, highly second Chris's recommendation. I think Isabel Wilkerson's one of those writers that teaches you without making you feel that you're being taught. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, She just has, so she won the Pulitzer for journalism a few years before she published that book. And you can just tell she's a journalist, but she writes like the people pieces and you can totally get that. Um, And if you haven't read Cast by Isabel Wilkerson, you absolutely should. Both of her books are absolutely fantastic. Yeah, I listened to that one on audio. I mean, and that's the thing as a journalist, she can tell a story. You know, I mean, some historians do get dinged quite often for not being able to engage the reader, um, Mm -hmm. especially those that are more, you know, academic, um, where they, you know, do their day job, so to say. So, yeah, that you're totally right, Russell, about that. Her journalism makes for engaging storytelling. She knows how to keep people reading. I wonder what she's working on next. I don't know. It'll be interesting. I don't know. But Warmth of Other Sun is fantastic. Fantastic. So I'm to my last book. Dun, 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 dun. Um, and so I had told Chris and um, Emily before this started that I've read one book in December. And it's this book. And it's my favorite book of the year. Wow. And this is why I always wait till the end to do these type of lists. Because you never know what December brings. But my favorite book right now is They're Going to Love You by Meg Howery. Jamie Attenberg, who most of us know, um, she wrote It's a Perfect Book. That's what she put on the back here. This is the story of a young woman. She's from a divorced family. Her father is a gay man who is in a relationship living in New York with his partner. And the book sort of takes place a lot in the 1980s. And she, more than anything, wants to live with her father and his partner. Um, She just feels like their house has this sort of grandiose nature, but they're dealing with the AIDS epidemic. They're dealing with their lives and she's learning so much from that relationship. But at the, really the core of this book is they're all dancers. Her mom was a ballerina. Her dad is a, was a ballerina and a choreographer. His partner is a choreographer. And this isn't about the dance world, but it's about how dance is so important, can become so important to people that it sort of gives them life. And this young woman, we learn very early in the book, something happened between her and her father. And there's been a 19 year gap. They haven't spoken. And he is ill and he's going to pass. And so her, his partner is called and said, it's time for you to come home. It's time for you to come say goodbye. So it flips back and forth between the history of the relationship of her with her father, with her mother, with dance, and the present time as she starts to sort of tell us how they got to this point and what happened. And what I think is so beautiful about this book, it's all about flawed people and how love sort of overcomes flaws if you let it. And um, the main character, you start sort of seeing her at the beginning of the book, you see her as maybe a person who has had all these struggles and maybe we should feel this immense sympathy for her. But as it goes along, her flaws come out and maybe the sympathy should go elsewhere. Mm -hmm. The author talks about music, which I eventually she would talk about these classical pieces that they would dance to. I've downloaded them all and I listen to them constantly Mm. she was a meg was a prior dancer so sort of the musicality of the whole thing 
is just beautifully written. The relationships are complicated and vivid and real. And this book at the end, whew, tears everywhere, people. I, I'm a bathtub reader and I was sitting in the bathtub, tears down my face, sobbing. My husband comes in, he goes, what is going on? I'm like, <laughs> we're going to love you. <laughs> Well, no wonder you haven't been able to read anything else this month. Right? I mean, that, it, yeah. It, um, it, I did. I got the arc, and I was like, I don't know. I don't know that it's for me. Um, and then I read something on it. I was at the bookstore. I was like, you know what? I'm going to buy it. If I buy it, I'll read it. I picked it up, and it blew my mind. Wow. So mm-hmm. highly recommend They're Going to Love You by Meg Howery. It is... Perfect. Hmm. I've never even heard of it except yeah. when I saw you writing about it, Russell. But yeah. Well, Emily, um, do you want to choose another book? Oh I no, mean, I'll take a hard pass. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I did my ten plus <laughs> twenty. Plus, plus, plus. <laughs> oh, listen to Russell. Plus plus plus. 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 He's not bitter. <laughs> Well, I'll be quick about my last book. Um, I've read some kids' books. I I always say kids' books. I read picture books this year. Um, When school load gets heavy, picture books are a great thing um, to fulfill that need to read, uh, but not too time-consuming. So my favorite picture book of the year is The Bad Seed by Jory John and illustrated by Pete Oswald. And this is part of the food group series. It's actually the first book in the food group series. The latest book that came out, I think is called Sour Grapes. Um, But the bad seed is about this little seed who is bad. You know, the little seed does bad things, but is he really bad? You'll have to read it and find out. But I love the illustrations. And it's a book that has stuck in my mind all year. Yeah. What did you just say? Children's books. books. Picture Picture books. books. Yeah. Picture books have, you know, moral compass. Oh, yeah. I just see the illustration of the bad seed, the bad seed. I just love it. <laughs> love it. So before we leave, everybody, we're each going to share two books that are coming out in 2023 that we're excited about. We know this is a really long episode, but we wanted to give a shout out to these books. Absolutely. So Russell, you're first. <laughs> um, so I have two. They're actually two sophomore novels by two authors that I read their debut novels and absolutely adored. So one is ginormous. So I know that neither Chris nor Emily will jump on this behemoth of a book. Wow. But this is called The Deluge by Stephen Markley. Now, Stephen Markley wrote a book called Ohio a couple of years ago. It was his debut fiction. I think he had written some nonfiction. Ohio is... It's one of my favorite debuts I've ever read in my entire life. It is fantastic. It deals with uh, the Rust Belt and all of that kind of stuff. But I'm going to have to have the book help me with this one because it is not an easy book for me to summarize. (laughs) Um, But Stephen King said that this is now going to be an American classic. So don't take my word for it. Take Stephen King's word for it. So it's in the first decades of the 21st century, the world is convulsing, its governments mired in gridlock while a patient but unrelenting ecological crisis looms. In California in 2023, Tony, a scientist, is studying deposits of undersea methane and receiving death threats. His fate will become bound to a stunning cast of characters, a broken drug addict, a star advertising strategist, a neurodivergent mathematician, a cunning eco-terrorist, an actor turned religious zealot, and a brazen young um, activist named Kate, who is in Wyoming trying to protect the decades to come. Mm, Sounds complicated. It's like half articles from magazines and half scientific papers and half the story and all of that kind of stuff. I This is probably going to be the book I start the year with. I think that's my plan. Um, it is really, really long. Um, the arc is 880 Ooh. pages, so wow. Wow. who knows what. But if you haven't read Ohio, I, this is one of my most anticipated. I've been waiting for him to come out with another book. I um, think, um, then, just to interrupt for one second, I think Ohio was one of the arcs that we all got together at um, one of the um, book expos. I think so too. Yeah, yes. I remember that. Yeah, 
but yeah. I never got I was to a it. a fantastic audio book too, if you okay. want to go that way. But um, I think he's a, re- a writer to watch. I just think he has a way of capturing America that's very unique. So, and then my second book is much thinner. So that one, it's called Decent People by Deshaun Charles Winslow. Um, his debut um, novel was called In West Mills. It's a town, and both of his books, it appears, are going to be set in West Mills. Um, And this is a murder uh, mystery set in 1976 in this North Carolina town. Three siblings are found dead. And um, there's a lot of finger pointing between the Black community and the white community. Who is responsible? Because there's been no murders in this community for some time. And the main character, who is also the main character from the first book, um, wants to investigate. She wants to figure out who killed these children. And she finds out that they're actually related to the man she has settled down with after returning to West Mills after living in New York. And she wants to know how that all fits into the family. It goes everywhere, cover-ups, medical misuse, um, illicit affairs that could just destroy the reputations of everybody in the town. So that's Decent People by Deshaun Charles Winslow. If you haven't read In the West Mills, that's it's excellent, excellent as well. Um, but I'm super excited to read his sophomore novel. That's awesome. And when do these come out? Uh, both of them come out in January, uh-huh. um, January 10th for the Deluge. And Decent People, I want to say like the end of the month. I apologize. This is a finished copy. They didn't give me a date with it. but He's another one that we saw. We saw him read from his first yes. novel at Book Expo. Yes. I remember that. Yeah. How exciting. Yes. So I'm super excited about The Wise Hours, A Journey into the Wild and Secret World of Owls by Miriam Darlington. Chris and I are lucky enough to hear owls at night sometimes where we live. And this is coming out on February 7th from Tin House. And it's kind of a combination memoir and study of owls. That's as much as I know about it. Um, she is a British nature writer. And I believe it has something to do with her teenage son that has epilepsy. So she Mm. somehow weaves those things together, which reminds me of the book Bomb Shelter, which was one of the books that came in and out of my top 10. So I'm just going to squeeze it in now (laughs) because that's a book of essays and it is about them discovering that her son has epilepsy. And then the other book I'm really excited about is Chain Gang All-Stars by Nane Kwame Ajay Brenya. He's the author of Friday Black, which was interestingly like a a set of short stories, which it's rare, I feel like, that an author, that's the first book they published. So this is going to be his debut novel, right? And it's kind of outside of my reading zone, but I loved Friday Black. The stories in that book stay with me. Oh, look, (laughs) Russell has a copy of it. Nice. Look it comes you. out on, in April. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, April fourth, and that's out from Pantheon, I think. Yep. Mm-hmm. And it's a he's really taking a look at. I mean, it's a novel, but he's taking a look at um, women in prison. I believe. Yeah, I know it's a like a prison novel. I don't know if it's specific to women. I haven't read it yet, but it is here. And I too, Emily, am so excited for that book. Yeah, I'm super excited. And then I'm just going to throw out one other. (laughs) (laughs) And this one isn't until the second half of the year. It's Alice Hoffman's new book called The Invisible Hour, out August 15th from Atria, Atria Books. And it has a theme, like Scarlet Letter theme. I think they even, like, someone goes back in time and talks to Nathaniel Hawthorne or something. That is so cool. I'm down for that. Yeah. Yeah. So, Emily, this is where I get to throw in the extra book. Hester by, I can't remember the author's name, I'm totally forgetting it, but was almost in this list, is a reimagining of the creation of The Scarlet Letter, a woman who meets Nathaniel Hawthorne and he winds up basing his book upon her life. It is fantastic. Yes. I want to read that one. I read the first couple pages in the bookstore the other day. It is so good. I want to read that for sure. I I had a really big Nathaniel Hawthorne phase. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, he appears in some Alice Hoffman, some other books of hers in the Rules of Magic, I think, series, right? Yeah. Well, his great-great-grandfather was one of the judges in the witch trials. Right. 
That's right. And that so, comes out in Hester. Mm-hmm. You should read it. It's very good. I promise. All right. Okay, yeah. everyone, two hours in, I'm going to remind you that we do put this in all, all this information in the show notes. So if your hands are cramping at this point, right. we will get you the author name for Hester. Don't worry. Check out bookcougars.com. It will be in the show notes. It will be there. So I have two. I read one and the other one I'm looking forward to. So the Writing Retreat, which I've talked about um, by Julia Bartz, is coming out February 21st from Simon & Schuster. This is a fun novel. It's horror, thriller. It's about aspiring writers who get accepted to this writing retreat that a real famous horror writer is putting on, a woman who writes about kick-ass women. So these women come to this retreat thinking they're just going to be working on their stuff. And they're told, no, you're going to be writing a brand new novel, a brand new story that I approve. And you have to write 3000 words a day to keep pace. And there are all these other expectations. Really enjoyed this one. Super strong beginning for sure. And then the other book is by Jenna Miller, Out of Character. And this one comes out February 7th from Quill Tree slash HarperCollins. And uh, Jenna Miller, somebody I've been following on Instagram for years, you know, before I think even she started writing this story, I think we got connected like during one of the readathons or something like that. And Out of Character is her debut novel. I should say The Writing Retreat is also a debut novel. Um, but Out of Character is about a young queer woman. There's a lesbian love story. It's a father daughter story. And it's also fat positive. Um, so I started it already. I have an arc and I put it down because I was in the midst of school stuff. And I said, no, I want to read this one during break so I can just really focus and enjoy it. I think it's going to be a real strong, really strong book and have a, a bright future. Wow, everybody. You know, sorry, everyone. This is the last episode of the Book Cougars because we're going to take the year off and read. <laughs> Oh my gosh, such a great, compelling list of books. And it's always shocking to me. Like you'd think we've all read some of the same books, but I've not read any of the books you mentioned, Russell. That's the wonderful world of books. I have said it all year. 2022 was a great year for books. It really was. So many different titles, so many different things out there. You can find something that really spoke to you. So yeah. 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 Thank you so much for your time. If Thank folks aren't following Russell on BookTube, get over there. We're going to put the links in the show notes. I love listening to how Russell talks about books, shows off his books and his covers. Mm-hmm. Really fun. Absolutely. And that's Ink and Paper Blog. Yep. yep. If you Google me, you'll find me. Ink and Paper Blog. So I'm there. Awesome. Thank you, Russell. This has been awesome Thank catching you. up with you and talking books. Now go eat your supper. <laughs> We appreciate you. He's about to pass out. We've kept him way past (laughs) dinner time. (laughs) Take care. Thank you. Thanks for listening to The Book Cougars with Chris Wallach and Emily Fine. We'll be back again with another episode in two weeks. Until then, come chat with us on social media, Goodreads, or email us at bookcougars at gmail.com. If you'd like to help support our podcast, please tell others about us, leave a review wherever you listen, and consider becoming a patron. Even a dollar a month is a big help. Learn more about that on our website, bookcougars.com, where you'll find the show notes for this and all of our past episodes. Happy Happy reading! reading. This episode was edited by Pat Keogh Sound Design. 